This is The Adoption Wait, a podcast brought to you by Adopting.com. I am your host, Lacey Richter, author, business owner, and a mom of two through domestic infant adoption who has endured the adoption wait five times over. Hello, and thank you for joining the Adoption Wait podcast. Today's guest is an online friend of mine, Samantha Morgan. Samantha is a fellow adoptive mom of three, a fellow published author, a speaker, and a fellow business owner. So we have a lot in common. Samantha created Rush to Hope Ministries, which is a grassroots support system for those dealing with infertility, miscarriage, loss of a child, are going through the adoption process. Hello, Samantha, and welcome to the Adoption Wait podcast. We are so happy to have you today. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I always forget how much I have in common with my guests until I do the introductions, and then I'm like, a fellow this and a fellow that. So we have so much in common. And today, Samantha and I are going to talk about another topic that we have in common. I've wanted to talk about this for quite a while now, and that is the topic of disrupted adoptions. So some people use the term interrupted adoptions, failed adoptions, unsuccessful adoptions. But today we're going to use the term disrupted adoption. And what that means is a waiting adoptive family and an expectant family were matched and the adoption stopped at some point before finalization. So, Samantha, I want to start where we always start here at the Adoption Wait podcast. And I want you to share the cliff notes or the short story um, of your family's adoption story and how you and your husband became parents. Yes, that is the age-old question. Why did you adopt? <laughs> well, my husband and how long did you wait? And how we long always did we want to know yes. that. So how long did you wait? Um, my husband and I dealt with years of infertility, and without getting into the whole infertility um, years, um, we dealt with unexplained infertility. At the end of our journey, it was unexplained. No one could tell us why, and the doctor pretty much said the sun and the moon and the stars are going to have to align before you and your husband get pregnant. And I really came to the point of, do I want to be a mom or do I want to be pregnant? And I just wanted to be a mom. And so I prayed and I prayed for my husband because that's a whole nother adoption uh, <laughs> podcast episode of when you're ready to adopt and your husband's not. But yes, I'm, I'm writing that down. We'll do that. But we, you know, that that's where we are. We're, we as women want a mother. And I think it's easier for a man to say, I'm content. Let's, we're fine with or without kids. That was my husband's um, viewpoint. And it was a very loving viewpoint. I mean, he's like, I'm fine with just being married and not having kids or I want kids, whatever you want. But um, I really prayed specifically for his heart to open up to the idea. And God placed um, some great mentoring men and some adoption situations in his path that really opened up his heart to adoption. And so that is why we adopted. Uh, And then our first adoption was international adoption. Um, We decided on a country in Eastern Europe is we had met some people who adopted from Eastern Europe. And so we ended up in Russia with our first adoption Our second adoption was domestic here in Missouri. And then our third baby was a surprise um, 16 year old uh, through foster care, through a kinship relationship. Um, So that's our three that we have now. So Um, you did such a great job making that short story because I know (laughs) that it is not a short story. And I'm so thankful that we connected online. So I want to turn our discussion to disrupted adoptions. And when my husband and I were going through the adoption process, the professionals we were working with, they mentioned the possibility of a disrupted adoption, but they didn't really prepare us for how to go through that experience if it happened. And I would also say they sort of brushed it aside, like it was very unlikely to happen. However, for anyone who knows my story, who's read my book, 
you'll know that my husband and I had three disrupted adoptions within one year. So Samantha, I want to ask you about the adoption professionals you worked with and did they prepare you for the experience or even talk about disrupted adoptions? They really didn't. And, uh, Our first was an international adoption, and that's where our disrupted adoption occurred. Um, They didn't mention it at all. Like it was a, oh, you'll get your placement, you'll go meet your kids, you'll go back for court, and then you'll bring them home. There was no, and even when we were going through um, our adoption first got disrupted and we got the phone call, they said, this never happens. We are so Mm. sorry. This just doesn't happen. And so I was completely blindsided. Yeah. Yeah. So very similar to us. So um, I know that that first disrupted adoption in your is a such a big part of your story. So will you share with us what happened um, during your first adoption? Um, So we had decided to internationally adopt from Russia and did everything that we should have start to finish home study to bringing him home was about a little over a year and a half, I would say almost two years, probably, which is very short for international even now. But uh, as we were um, adopting, we got our first match with two children. We had requested to adopt two at the same time. I wanted siblings so that they would have each other, that they would be um, you know, we, we was, I already knew we were removing them from a culture and removing them from the only thing that they knew. I wanted them to have each other. So we'd requested to have siblings and we went over there and we met Yegor and Krishina and he was four. She was almost two. And we just, I just fell in love with them. So we, in Russia, you make three trips, you go and you spend a week with the kids bonding you fly home and then you fly back for court, your court date, and then you fly back again for to pick them up. So there's a waiting okay. period in between each. You can wait over there, but if you wait over there, it would have been like months you were waiting in between. Okay. And so we met Yegor and Krishina, fell in love with them, spent the whole week bonding. By the end of the week, they were so excited to see us. And we flew home. I had got the nursery ready. I got their pictures on the wall, clothes, the baby showers, like this was happening. And two days before we fly back, we got a phone call from the agency that um, no one wants to get. And... They made me get my husband on the phone with me. I was teaching school at the moment. I was a school teacher. And they said, are you sitting down? Is your husband with you? Um, And I knew something was wrong. And they said, the aunt of of the children want to keep them. And you you can't adopt them. You, You could fight her, but you wouldn't win. You're not Russian. So, um but the adoption had gone so far. We were getting ready to go to court that next Monday. This was like on a Thursday, Friday, like we were two days before flying out. And they said, the adoption's gone so far. You still have to appear in court to stop this adoption so that you can see other kids. And Oh, by the way, we don't have any other kids ready for you. So yes, we, my husband had to drag me back on that plane. I was yeah. not okay <laughs> at that point. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so we flew back, not knowing if we would have any kids, not knowing we're just making an extra flight to Russia just for, just to appear in court at this point. Um, and they called us on the way and said they found a little girl for us to go see. And that was it. So that's, So we went and we had to appear in court. Everyone was so apologetic. I will say everyone over there, even the judge and Russians are so stoic. They are so, Mm -hmm. everyone was visibly upset for us. So obviously this didn't happen very often, Mm -hmm. but they said it is happening more often because they were changing some laws where they were helping family members um, financially keep kids in Russia. So, okay. So that's what happened with ours. Wow. Um, 
That is an incredibly unique story. And I feel you when you say I was not okay. And although we were both laughing when you said that, I totally get it. I've been there. Um, Our three disrupted adoptions were very different from each other, very different from yours. But I remember I had this wide spectrum of emotions and feelings. And our first disruption was actually due to a loss of life. Um, An expectant mother we were matched with went all the way to 39 weeks and she, um, her baby was stillborn and we were not prepared for this. She was not prepared for this so much grief. And then our second loss, I remember I was angry, very angry. And then I was guilty because I was angry and there was just this, so many emotions. And I just want other waiting adoptive families who have maybe experienced disrupted adoptions to know that all these feelings are very normal. Um, I want to normalize the anger, the grief, the loss, the hopelessness. And I want to ask you a little bit about any specific feelings or emotions you remember that surprised you that you had to process um, after that disrupted adoption. I was, I was so angry. There was very little support on the agency side. Um, Mm. besides, Oh, I'm sorry. Here's another, we'll find you someone like we'll find another one. So I think, I think I was very angry, but I was also just really numb, I guess is the word. Mm. Um, I didn't really know what to feel. And and so for like, we didn't go through as long of a wait for our happy ending as probably you did. Cause you went through three, um, mm-hmm. back to back and ours was a, a very quick turnover of emotional. I'm angry. I don't understand. I'm numb. I'm just going through the motions at this point to here's your son. I would say that is probably a less than five days for us of complete utter, I've never been so low and disappointed in my whole life to exuberant joy of this is it. This is this. I understand now why, like I got the, okay, God, I understand why this happened much quicker than you did. I think. Um, Yeah. Um, and you mentioned something to me when we talked about your story in pre-interview where, once you went through this experience and then you, you guys have to read the book to hear the rest of the story. We'll talk a little bit more about it, but um, then you had two more adoptions and your second adoption um, during your revocation period, it was, it was a domestic infant adoption. Correct. Um, And so during your revocation period, you had a lot of feelings and, and I know these well also because Every waiting adoptive family has a lot of anxiety during revocation, but once you've experienced a disrupted adoption, this level of anxiety is, it goes through the roof. Um, Tell me about that and how you got through that revocation. Yes. So again, I, I think the agency doesn't prepare you for this part at all. Yes. Because you're Agreed. really at the mercy of the birth parents. We, our scare was not really with the birth mom. She was, she's amazing. So strong, knew exactly what she wanted to do, but our birth father was involved. And um, so that is kind of where it got scary for us um, because mm-hmm. you're at their mercy of when do they, when can they get back? When will they come sign the papers? We don't know. Can we get a hold of will them? Will they again? sign the paper? Will they sign? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, we were actually in the hospital for four days, which is longer than with a normal new newborn. Mm-hmm. Um, and had some problems getting them to just sign the first papers to allow us to leave the hospital with her. Mm-hmm. And then we went through a two week period of just unknown. So it was two weeks of, I don't know if I should bond with this baby. It's two weeks of, I, yes. I don't know if I, 
I'm already attached. So like, mm-hmm. that's hard enough. Um, but also, and not everybody's the same as, as we are, but we didn't tell anybody. So, mm-hmm. you know, obviously everybody knew we had adopted Rush. Everyone knew that we were, we were looking into adoption again, that we probably would adopt again, but we didn't blast it out everywhere. We're adopting, we're adopting. I just didn't want to answer all the questions. It's exhausting. You know, how's the adoption going? How's it's like, well, it's great. Someone's looking. Oh no. By the time you talk to them again, you're two, you're, you're two times past. Right. That's right. So I think I watched your last podcast and you guys were talking about that. Um, yeah, we were. So I just didn't, I didn't tell a lot of, uh, extended friends. My circle knew mm-hmm. we, uh, I just wanted that surprise with my parents too. So I didn't tell my parents we were expecting when we got matched I didn't tell our parents <laughs> because mm-hmm. we were going to have a baby so quickly. We, we met our birth mom in August and she was due in September. And the first, I will never forget the first thing she got up and hugged my neck as soon as I walked in and just says, we love you guys. You guys are it. And I'm dilated to a two. So you better be ready. Like that. Yeah. That's what she told us. <laughs> and so I just thought, keep this a surprise for our parents. Like, so mm. we didn't call that my best friend knew and she came and stayed with our son. And then on day three in the hospital, I called both of our parents and I said, Hey, would you, we're at the hospital. Do you want to come up to the hospital? And both of them had extremely different reactions. When I, (laughs) my mom said, what did Michael do? Is he okay? (laughs) And um, his mom was just cool as a cucumber. And I'm like, well, would you like to come meet your new grandbaby? I didn't even tell him as a boy or a girl. And they just both. So that was the best surprise ever. And um, then we had that two week waiting period and our community didn't know. And I had this baby at home and we had a business at that point. And people started asking because I barricaded my house and I thought, Mm -hmm. I can't tell anyone if this doesn't happen that Mm -hmm. I had to give this baby back. Like I, Mm -hmm. I don't want that chain of events of the eighth person in line that heard that the Morgans adopted again to see me in Walmart with, with an empty cart and go, where's your baby? Mm-hmm. I, I could, just couldn't do it. So, mm-hmm. so we, I kept it a secret for two weeks and one of my best friends in, a, in the adoption world um, is a photographer and she came over and did our, our newborn pictures. And I just couldn't keep it in <laughs> with her yeah, because it's just raw. It's still raw. Just thinking back to, what if, what if, so, yeah. so many, what but, yeah, but luckily, finally, everything worked out two weeks later, it was two weeks, just about till everything was signed, finalized. And you just feel like you can go, <sighs> okay, yeah, now life can begin, you know? So, yeah. Um, I had so many, uh, you know, we had three. And so I had different experience with everyone. And even when we were still just waiting for our first adoption. I remember not sure who to tell, when to tell, how to tell. I remember all these feelings that you're having too. And I think what I realized after the fact of a couple really hard things is that it actually, it felt harder to share the bad news or the um, unexpected news, but having a community support you through both your high highs and your low lows could be incredibly helpful. Um, but I know there's just this feeling there of how much do I want to share and, and what do I want to share? It's, su- it's such a personal decision. Yeah. Um, you know, in my experience, it didn't take me very long after those disruptions to come to this like epiphany and this realization. I remember sitting on my front porch after our first disruption and I was journaling and writing and I realized I had all this like anger and this grief and this guilt inside of me. And then I went, wait a minute, 
Like in no way did I want to parent a child whose expected parent wasn't 100% sure of their decision or who was able to find resources and support and family to step in and help them. And I realized like I was calling them at the time failed adoptions, but they weren't failed adoption. They weren't failures. They were actually successes. Mm -hmm. You know, if we really shift our perspective and start thinking about the expected parents in these situations and how um, they found what they needed and they got the resources and they got the help. So, so that was actually a success. And I want to talk, like ask you a question and I'm sure it's a, it's a very sensitive question. Like how do you feel now about your disrupted adoption and those two children and um, how do you feel about that now sitting where you are right now? I know that I have the kids that God had planned for me. And I know that that pain in my story allowed them to get out of the orphanage, but also to stay with family and to stay in that culture and language and everything that they knew was the same. And Mm. so I know that God had them exactly where he wanted them and that I was just this much of a part of that story because their family hadn't come and visited them in the orphanage for two years. Had we not tried to get them, tried to adopt them, then they may never have gotten that. They may never have been placed back with family. They may, that family had may never have gotten that support that they needed to be able to say, yeah, I will keep them here. Um, yeah. So I feel like God didn't just get, um, my son out of the orphanage, he allowed me to get these two kids out of the orphanage as well. So he didn't, he doubled my expectations. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I say in the book, how I mentioned a little girl that was involved in our story and we didn't adopt a little girl. Um, but there was another family there that absolutely gives me goosebumps that, um, she went home with, we, we had to decide, three days after we met him, we met her. And then we had to decide if we were going to take them both or just take one. And there was another family at that moment that we were having to decide. And my husband who didn't want to adopt wanted them all at this point. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, but at that moment we were talking and praying about it. I just had this overwhelming feeling that she was not ours and she belonged to somebody else. And that family next in the next hotel room was getting told that their adoption had fell through and they were there for a little girl and they ended up taking her home. We took our son home and Yegor and Christina went home with family. So I always tell people that even though it was extremely painful for us to go through that and through that period of that, I was angry and I was numb and I just was so disappointed. It was so necessary for these four kids that got, you know, we, we went and we thought we were going to adopt two and God's like, no, I'm going to double your expectation and I'm going to get four out of this orphanage. Yeah. So God's story is not like a book of a start to a finish. It's this beautiful tapestry that at some point our threads are going to cross, but then they, they may go a completely different direction. And so that's, With Yegor and Krishina, I just feel like that was a part, a small part of their story to get them out of that orphanage, then it was worth the pain that I had to go through. And yeah, and I mean, how beautiful is that? Like your pain was part of their story. And I think um, that's the overwhelming um, theme in adoption the pain and the joy always side by side. Right. Um, You know, I remember on our second disrupted adoption, we were called by our lawyer. Um, Of course, you remember that phone call. I remember that phone call and the birth family was on their way to get a baby, uh, a baby that we named a baby that lived in our home for five days, a baby that we bonded with. Um, And I remember I immediately wanted to just run away from the pain. 
And I actually was just wanted to like dive right back into the adoption wave for whatever <laughs> reason, I don't know. And we met with the birth family in a neutral location at our church and our pastor was there and he sat with us and he gave me some really wise words to use in that situation and in all situations is he told me not to run, not to run from that pain, but to actually sit in it and grieve it and process it before we moved forward. And I want to encourage anyone who has experienced a disrupted adoption that your pain is normal, your spectrum of feelings, even anger, sometimes guilt, all of that is normal. And to take time to grieve that and feel that because six months, one year, 10 years down the road, you're going to have a completely different perspective on this experience and where you what role you played in this story, just like you were telling us. Um, so what words of encouragement do you have for waiting adoptive families who are maybe stuck and struggling to move forward through a disrupted adoption? Mm, yeah. You said just the right thing is to sit in that grief. Like when you don't know what to pray, and you're just there, just grieve what you've lost, you know, before you move on. I found myself and I can't, I can't not talk about God when I talk about mm-hmm. adoption because it's just there. Um, and I found so much comfort. You know, so many people want to say, oh, Romans 8, 28, God has all things, you know, good. Everything's going to work out for good. And that's great when you're happy, but what do you do when you're, when you don't know what to pray? And I just want to read just a little bit before that beautiful verse is the good stuff is the stuff that you need to focus on when you are in the pit of despair. And yeah, Romans eight eighteen says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And this goes on to say that when you don't know what to pray, the spirit intercedes for you. So just cry (laughs) and grieve (laughs) and understand that our Lord is grieving with you. Like he gave up his son too for, for our, for our benefit. And, um, you know, it goes on 824 says for this hope, we were saved, but hope that it's seen is no hope at all. And who hopes for what he already has. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And then it goes on to say, God has good in store for you through all of our pain. But it, like you said, it may be a year, it may be three, it may be 10 years for you to look back and go, that pain was necessary. Maybe not for me, but for somebody else. And to be just a small part in that story, um, it's, but it's okay to sit and grieve what you've lost. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. I love that. Um, You know, with every episode, and I, I like to leave uh, waiting adoptive families with like two to three practical tips of what to do while they're waiting um, to just turn it into like an expectant, hopeful time, even though, even though sometimes it feels hopeless, sometimes it feels low. Um, and I think we know what you did, which was pray and um, get a good perspective and write. Um, Do you have any other practical tips? What can they be doing right now to stay hopeful? Don't let the adoption consume you. Ooh. I would get some hobbies that are not (laughs) adoption or baby or child related. Yes. 100%. Or you will drive yourself crazy. You know, like even when you're reading, get a good Bible study, read your Bible, 
but don't read all about Hannah and Sarah. <laughs> just like, just read your Bible just to enjoy reading and getting closer to God. Enjoy yeah. gardening. I enjoyed getting out and digging in the dirt. I still do. Like, find hobbies that have nothing to do with adoption and children and babies. That is such a great tip. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it will consume you it if does. you let it. That's great. Um, Samantha, this has been a really hard but great conversation. And I'm so thankful for you to take the time out of your day to encourage waiting adoptive families. I know you have many projects um, coming up and you just sent me a manuscript for some children's books. And we have your book, uh, Miraculously My Own, that tells um, the full story of your adoption. And I think Um, I'm going to put this link in the show notes for anyone who it says one woman's incredible journey of infertility, faith and adoption. And I highly recommend it to our listeners um, when they want to read adoption related content. (laughs) Um, Tell us what projects you're working on, what we can expect for you in the next year and where we can find you online. Okay. Okay. Um, Yes, we have the book Miraculously My Own. It's out there and it is as much for your parents and your friends as it is for you. Um, Yeah, we talked earlier. I wrote it more like a novel so that they can really feel what it's like to go through this and go through a disrupted adoption. Um, And I do buy more than one copy, one for yourself (laughs) and one for your parents and one for your friends. (laughs) share it around. And yes, I am this year. I'm really wanting to get my, I have three um, children's books that I'm working on. One is for siblings of um, the adopted child. So how to talk to your, your children that are in your house about your adoption and why you're waiting and how you're going to be waiting for that adoption. One for the adopted child of how your family waited while they were waiting for them. And then I'm writing one for um, siblings of biological siblings for the birth mother's children of where, where is this baby going? What is adoption? Where is this baby going? Cause it's not he or she's not coming home with us. So, oh my gosh. So it's going to be what a um, needed book. Yeah. Th- uh, three books for very different people, very different kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully that'll be in the next year. And then they can find me on Rush to Hope, um, Rush to Hope.com, Rush to Hope on Instagram, Rush to Hope um, with Samantha Morgan on Facebook. I'm all, all on there. And I just love encouraging other adoptive moms, people who are in the wait, because that was the hardest part. And that was the part that, there's very little support there in that long waiting season or short waiting season because every adoption is different. So, yep. And if they wanted to connect with me personally, I'm at rush to hope ministries at gmail.com. So everything is rush to hope. I'm going to put all of the ways to contact Samantha and how to get her book in our show notes for all of our listeners. I highly recommend Samantha's Instagram page. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a social media manager. I create content for some adoption agencies and some other businesses, some real estate. And I have dove into Samantha's content, her reels. I wish I would have had this very relatable content when I was waiting to adopt because sometimes adoption can feel so lonely so low and we can't find some of the humor in it and samantha can find that for you and you can share that um with your waiting adoptive friends and family so they can just get you a little bit more um so thank you for samantha for creating that content it is very encouraging and um empathetic also at the same time thank you for being with us today um i know that this episode and and all of your words and practical tips will encourage our listeners. Thank you, Lacey. It was such a blessing to be here.